Can you write a program that prints out its own source code without copying it from anywhere? Uh, and I mean this both ways. The program shouldn't copy its source code from disk or some server, and you shouldn't copy the solution from someone else's. And if you're already experienced and you've written your own quines before, I have a harder challenge for you too. Can you write a pair of programs in two different languages that, when run, print each other's source code, such as this monstrosity here? It actually even works modulo bit rock. It was written over 20 years ago. And if you hang around till the end, I'll tell you where it comes from. Welcome to Frank's Diana Explains. I'm Professor of Security and Privacy at the University of Cambridge, and we are almost getting to the end of my cybersecurity course for second year undergraduates. Use the playlist above to access all the other lectures. Today's topic is malware, such as computer viruses, and the challenge with which I opened the video is to get you thinking about the complex and intellectually fascinating idea of self-replicating programs. I'm not going to teach you how to write a virus, but I want to explore with you the hardest part of doing so, which is indeed the self-replication part. Because, as ever, you can't beat the bad guys unless you are capable of outsmarting them. But once again, I urge you to do so responsibly. Many famous viruses and worms, including the Internet Worm of 1988 and the Sami Worm of 2005, that we mentioned in previous lectures, were written by bright people about your age, and these guys, who obviously had excess IQ points, were not evil. They did it because it was an intellectual challenge. They released their creations out of curiosity to see what would happen, and this was a spectacularly bad idea. The programs went out of control and caused a lot of damage that the creators didn't really mean to cause. Please don't do that. Do the smart part, which is the hard computer science and the creative insight about self-replication. But don't do the idiotic and irresponsible part, which is releasing the self-replicating program outside of your own sandbox. Of course, there are viruses that are written with purposefully evil intent, whether by criminals engaging in theft and extortion or by nation states engaging in cyber war, and that's why people like me want to bring up new generations of intelligent good people like you and make them competent at the hardcore technical stuff about cybersecurity. Otherwise, there would be no one capable of defending us from these attacks. So let's begin by stating what we mean by malware. Malware, malicious software, is a generic catch-all term for evil programs. That is to say, any software that will damage computer systems or network. The following definition of malware is from a web page I found from Cisco. Any intrusive software developed by cyber criminals, often called hackers, to steal data and damage or destroy computers and computer systems. Examples of common malware include viruses, worms, Trojan viruses, spyware, adware, and ransomware. So the above taxonomy of categories of malware is not exhaustive, and not everyone agrees on the precise definitions, but it's still good to have at least a general idea of what these various nouns mean. Notice the inconsistency that sometimes the terms identify and classify the malware on the basis of the attack vector, or how the malware gets into your system, as in the case of virus, worm, and trojan, whereas in other cases they refer to the payload, or what the malware does to your system, as in the case of spyware, adware, and ransomware. So you could reasonably have any combination of you know, the virus, worm, and trojan as the vector, uh, and the spyware, adware, or ransomware as the payload. For example, you could have a trojan delivering some ransomware. So let's go through these in order. A virus is a piece of malware that attaches itself to executables and replicates itself, infecting other executables. When you run one of the programs on your system, if it has been infected by a virus, it will first run the virus and then your original program. The virus, when executed, may behave in one of several ways. It may look for other executables and infect them. It may patch itself into the operating system and intercept system calls. It may do nothing, remaining stealthy until a certain trigger condition is met. Or it may activate its payload. The virus can be quite elaborate, but it's just a vector, a method of propagation. What damage it causes to your system, for example, deleting all your files or installing a keylogger or sending your banking credentials to a cyber criminal, that depends on the payload that's installed inside the virus. There is a delicate balance between causing damage and propagating. A virus whose payload stays dormant for months may spread rather more widely than one that 
causes immediate damage and then therefore alerts its victim to its presence, triggering immediate attempts at removing the virus. The former strategy was adopted, among others, by the 1991 Michelangelo DOS virus, whose hardest-destroying payload would only activate on the 6th of March every year, which was the birthday of the eponymous Italian artist. Self-replicating computer programs were first described by computer pioneer John von Neumann back in 1949. The first viruses started circulating in the wild in the 1980s on the personal computers of the time, first the Apple II and then the IBM PC, and later on the cheaper home computers such as Commodore Amiga and Atari ST. In the early 1980s, hard disk was still expensive and comparatively rare among hobbyists, so viruses infected floppy disks, which were the most common storage medium. Floppies were frequently passed around among users, and this was how the virus spread from machine to machine in the days before global networking. The fact that floppies were not permanently inserted into the machine made it really hard to eradicate an infection. It was always highly likely that a few infected disks would still lie around somewhere, ready to reinfect the system even after the most thorough of cleanups. The most fertile ground for viruses throughout the 1980s and 1990s were the MS-DOS and later MS-Windows PCs, both because these were the most popular platforms and because those single-user operating systems running on processors without protected mode allowed any running program to do anything it wanted to the host machine and its peripherals. The first documented IBM PC virus, the so-called Brain from Pakistan, appeared in 1986. A later development was the concept macrovirus of 1995. The introduction of Visual Basic Macros into Microsoft Word and Excel had effectively transformed textual documents and spreadsheets into executables. Office employees sharing these files by email were unaware that they might also be spreading viruses. The first antivirus programs relied on detecting so-called signatures, which is to say byte sequences that uniquely identified a particular virus. Virus authors responded by encrypting the code of the virus with a variable key, hiding the opcodes of the virus in a different way at each new infection. Antivirus authors in turn would detect the signature of the decryption engine, which had to remain in plain text to do its job. So the next counter-attack by virus writers consisted of polymorphic viruses, where the decryption engine itself would mutate at every infection. Antivirus authors then gradually switched to heuristic detection methods, looking not for ways of recognizing previously observed instances of a specific virus, but rather looking for behavioral patterns typical of viruses but uncommon in regular programs, such as, you know, this program modifies itself. This arms race brings to mind the delightful music to break phonographs by in Douglas Hofstadter's masterpiece Gödel Escher Bach, which predates this virus wars and yet insightfully addresses many of the most intellectually interesting aspects. I think I'll have to make a video, or perhaps several videos, about Gödel Escher Bach at some point. It's one of my favorite books ever, and it's bound to delight the kind of people who enjoy the material in my computer science videos. A worm is also a self-replicating piece of malware, but unlike a virus, it does not infect another executable, and therefore it doesn't need to infect the host program. A worm simply sends copies of itself through the network infecting other connected machines. To run on remote hosts, it may exploit common vulnerabilities. The first known worm was Creeper, written in 1971 to experiment with those von Neumann ideas on self-replicating programs. It spread through the ARPANET. It was followed by Reaper, which was designed to get rid of it. This chase in cyberspace was the inspiration for the 1984 Core Wars programming game. Very fun. Made popular by A.K. Dudney in Scientific American. The first worm to spread extensively in the wild was the Morris worm of 1988, which we mentioned several times in this course. It did not contain a destructive payload, but it replicated so aggressively that it brought the infected machines to their knees just by overloading them. It caused a major outage on the pre-consumer internet. To infect machines, it relied on a variety of attack techniques we studied in this course, including exploiting a buffer overflow in FingerD and brute forcing easy passwords. 
A worm that received substantial media coverage was Stuxnet, which appeared in 2010. Stuxnet was a cyber weapon aimed at physically damaging Iranian uranium-enriching centrifuges, which it did in vast numbers. It infected over 200,000 computers, and it destroyed 20% of Iran's nuclear centrifuges. It exploited several zero-day vulnerabilities in Microsoft Windows, but it initially bridged the air gap to the Iranian nuclear facilities through infected USB sticks. A Trojan horse, or often just a Trojan, is a piece of malware disguised as something else that the victim can be easily enticed to open, for example an attachment from a known contact, or a letter promising fabulous benefits, or a letter demanding money from the tax office, or free pornographic material, and so forth. The Trojan, therefore, always propagates through some kind of social engineering. The payload of the Trojan, like that of the virus or the worm, could be anything. The locution Trojan virus, used in the Cisco quote above, is an oxymoron, because a virus would propagate by self-replication and infection of executables, whereas a Trojan horse is, by definition, propagated by tricking the victim into launching it. It's true that the Trojan could, as its payload, drop a virus on the victim's machine, for example, in order to spread further through the victim's organization, but if we are just explaining the terms, let's not get entangled into combinations and keep the virus and the Trojan separate. Anyway, by extension, dropping a malware-laden USB stick in the car park of one's victim, as Stuxnet apparently did to gain entry, can be considered a physical world application of the Trojan horse technique. Spyware is malware designed to sit silently on the victim's machine and allow the attacker to monitor what goes on, including potentially logging keystrokes and capturing passwords, turning on the camera and the microphone, exfiltrating files, and so on. Spyware, like adware and ransomware, indicates a kind of payload, not a propagation vector. A piece of spyware could be dropped on your computer or phone by a variety of means, including as the payload of a virus, of a worm, or a trojan. Spyware is generally designed to be stealthy, so as to allow continued monitoring of the victim for an extended period of time. The sophisticated Pegasus spyware we mentioned in our first lecture, first discovered in 2016, is a cyber weapon that attacks iOS and Android smartphones and that has been used by various oppressive regimes to spy on political opponents, dissidents, human rights activists and journalists. Adware is malware that displays advertisements on your screen, usually after installing itself through subterfuge and without your consent. Some adware may include functionality bordering on spyware. It may do some kind of user profiling in order to decide which adverts to serve to you. Ransomware is malware that encrypts your files, making them inaccessible to you, but promises to decrypt them back if you pay a ransom to the attacker in some untraceable way, usually involving cryptocurrency. The first known instance of malware that encrypted files and demanded a ransom was the AIDS Trojan of 1989. This malware actually only encrypted the file names, not the files themselves, and it did so with a symmetric key that the knowledgeable person could ex extract from the malware itself. But it's only in the past decade that ransomware has become prominent, no doubt aided by the appearance and rise of Bitcoin. The theoretical foundations of strong ransomware were laid in a 1996 article, well before Bitcoin's appearance in 2009, by Adam Jung and Motte Jung, who dubbed the attack crypto-viral extortion. The malware encrypts the files using a randomly generated symmetric key, then it encrypts that key under the public key of the crook, and it deletes the plain text version of both the files and the symmetric key. It then prompts the victim to send the encrypted key to the crook, together with a ransom payment, in order to receive a usable decryption key by return. Under this scheme, it is not possible for the victim to recover the decryption key by dissecting the malware. This type of cybercrime is on the rise. You might have heard of CryptoLocker in 2013, of WannaCry in 2017, which infected hundreds of thousands of computers in 150 countries, and here in the UK it affected a number of NHS hospitals. You may have heard of Petia, which in 2017 was used in high-profile cyber attacks on Ukraine. The best safeguard against ransomware is to keep up-to-date offline backups, but this is a preventive recommendation that is of little use to someone who has just fallen victim to the attack. Viruses and worms started out as intellectual curiosity that degenerated into mischief, 
But by and large, during the 1980s and 1990s, most malware was pointless vandalism rather than lucrative criminal activity. You know, you'd had the virus that would reformat your hard disk. Ha ha ha, but nobody gained anything from that. The start of the monetization at scale of computer crime might arguably be traced back not to malware, but to phishing in the early 2000s. Nowadays, thanks to a convergence of factors, including the ubiquity of the internet and always-on networking, the emergence of e-commerce and online banking, and to some extent the anonymous payments made possible by cryptocurrencies, malware has graduated from mere vandalism to theft, as in banking keyloggers, extortion, as in ransomware, industrial or political espionage, spyware, and even cyber weapons, attacks on industrial control systems and other critical infrastructure, as Stuxnet did. From the viewpoint of computer science rather than that of criminology, perhaps the most intellectually interesting aspect of all the above is self-replication of programs. I keep telling you that to beat the bad guys, we must be at least as smart as them, so let's try to be as smart as those who created the first viruses. The virus must contain code that replicates itself. Can you write a program in your favorite programming language that prints out a copy of its source code on standard output when executed? That's a challenging puzzle. Douglas Hofstadter, yes, him again, was the one who first called such self-reproducing programs quines, again in his brilliant book Gödel Escher Bach, in honor of logician Willard van Orman Quine. It's instructive to invest some time in confronting this challenge without looking up a solution, and it's extremely rewarding to find a solution. Your first few attempts will show you what doesn't work. Using Python 3, for example, you could write a program that says print blah, and this will output a disappointing blah. And the equally unsuccessful attempt of print, print blah, will output print blah. And obviously, there will always be an extra layer of print in the source that this naive strategy can never capture. A better strategy might be to build up a string variable containing the source code and printing that. Now, obviously, the string cannot contain all of the source code, but if we could somehow substitute the stuff we have in here uh, with the source string itself, then perhaps we might be getting somewhere. Now, after all, Python offers you many ways of replacing substrings. You could use the you know, dot replace method, uh, you could use regular expressions, you could use uh, format strings, you could use percent expansion and so on. So maybe with this hint you could make some progress towards a program that prints itself. Have a go. Back in 1998, when I was a first year PhD student in computer security here at Cambridge, I presented a paper at the International Python Conference that, among other things, introduced what became the Python motto of batteries included. And the title of my paper was Why I Switched from Tickle to Python. And I wanted to conclude my presentation with something quirky and intriguing that sent the message that the Tickle and the Python programming language communities had good things to learn from each other. So I came up with this scary hack, a Python program that, if run, prints the source of a Tickle program that, if run, prints the source of the Python program we began with. So a two-step, two-language quine. I'd never seen it done before, and it took me a whole night of hacking to pull it off, but boy was I excited when it finally worked. Once again, you'll get no course credits if you do this, but if you are enjoying this material, then have a go yourself with any two programming languages that you like, and it's really a thrill when it finally works. Of course, as I said in the opening of this video, solutions that copy their source code instead of generating a string from first principles must be considered cheating, as there's no intellectual challenge in that. The Sami worm we discussed in the cross-site scripting lecture managed to access its own source through the document body inner HTML, although Kamkar reports that MySpace attempted to preempt such exploits by stripping out the string inner HTML anywhere it found it. As you will recall from that lecture, Kamkar defeated that countermeasure by evaluating the concatenation of two substrings, in and r HTML. What would have happened if MySpace had been successful in preventing the worm from accessing its own source? Would you, for example, be able to redo task 6 of the seed lab on cross-site scripting without using either the link or the DOM approach, but rather by self-generating the source? This is a much harder challenge than any of the other seed labs I have asked you to do in this course. 
And if you manage to do that by the end of May 2022, feel free to email me your solution. You'll get no course credits here either, but I will be really impressed and I'll remember you for later. Now, I have a sweet spot for people who do really well in my challenges, whether in my courses here at Cambridge or in the CTF competitions that I have been organizing over the years, all of which you can find in the respective playlists here on this channel. And in the past, quite a few such people have ended up getting very well paid part time jobs for my company, Cambridge Cyber. If you're interested, the above is one possible way that you can get onto my radar. We're getting to the end of this cybersecurity course, and I hope you enjoyed it so far. If you did, it would mean the world to me if you said your thank you by clicking the like button on this and on all the other videos in this course that you enjoyed, or at least you learned something useful from. If you're willing to go one step further, I would also be very, very grateful if you filled in the survey in the description before the deadline indicated in there, which is in a few days. I put many months of work and many all-nighters into preparing this new course, and I'm keen to hear what the first batch of students, you, thought of it so that I can adjust my aim for future editions. But this course is not over quite yet, so join me for the last video on locks and lock picking, which will go live in a premiere on what is officially the last day of the course. During the premiere, there will be a live chat and I'll be there and I hope you will be there too. See you then.